A very good morning to all my dear friends in the US and a good evening to all my colleagues and friends at Mysuru. A very warm welcome to all of you for the session today. Friends, COVID-19 has in many ways changed our lives across countries and continents. From sheer health, well-being, travel, lifestyle, sensibilities, and so on. And we have innumerable lessons to learn from this. Well, friends, the topic for the session today is lessons to learn from COVID-19. And we are fortunate to have with us Dr. R. Balasubramaniam, founder and president Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement as the speaker for the session today. Welcome, sir. Thank you. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Balu to all of you. Having embarked on his journey in the development sector by living and working for several years among remote forest-based tribal communities in the Southern Indian district of Mysuru, Dr. R. Balasubramaniam Balu is a widely respected development activist, leadership trainer, thinker, and a writer. After his MBBS, he earned his MPhil in hospital administration and health systems management from Bits Pilani. He has a master's in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard University. His living habits were greatly influenced by the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. And at the age of 19, he founded the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement based on the principles of Satya, truthfulness, ahimsa, nonviolence, seva, service, and tyaga, sacrifice. He has spent the last 36 years of his life in the service of the rural and tribal poor in the forests of India. He is also the founder and chairman of Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, a public policy think tank in India. Dr. Balu embodies a rare blend of grassroots and macro perspectives and policy through his multifaceted experience of more than three decades. He is a Tata Scholar, a Mason Fellow of the Harvard Kennedy School and a Fellow at the Horses Center for Civil Society, Harvard University. He is currently a visiting professor at Cornell University, USA and at IIT Delhi, India, where he teaches courses on leadership and human development. He coaches and mentors senior leaders in the nonprofit, corporate, government, and educational sectors globally, apart from running leadership workshops for people from these sectors. Dr. Balu has been recently appointed as the member human resources of the Capacity Building Commission of India with the mandate of capacity building uh, of 5 million Indian civil servants to make them future fit. He has authored seven books, both in Kannada, which is our local language in Karnataka, and in English. His latest book, Leadership Lessons for Daily Living, has been released. More about him, his works, and books are at drrbalu.com. Sir, with this introduction, uh, we have with us today the distinguished faculty and interns from various universities. We have uh, Professor Donna with her team of TAs and interns from Cornell University, Professor Carly and interns from the University of Iowa, Professor Carol Lucinda and interns from Allegheny College and Denison University. Uh, of course, we are all eager, sir, to listen to you about this uh, very intriguing and uh, uh, you know engaging topic. And uh, from all of us here, uh, welcome once again and over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sudarshan. Uh, would Donna or anybody else would like to say something before I start? Donna? Yes, I'm, it's just such a pleasure to see everyone. And we're looking forward to your talk today, Dr. Balu. But to see Carol and, and Lucinda, it's, it, bring, it warms my heart. So, um, And it's great to see your students. And we are so pleased to be doing what we've always done in the past, which is our groups integrate and we learn together and uh, we celebrate being in India together. So it's great that we can do it in this virtual space. And you may re uh, remember Terrell and Q, they are our TAs this year. So really wonderful to see you and it's, it's, um, and it's wonderful to see your students. Lucinda Carroll, would you like to say a few words before I start off? 
Thank you, Balu. It's so good to see you and Donna and of course, Sudarshan and Dr. Reiko are such a pleasure for our students to be able to interact mm -hmm. and uh, be in this program and learn from our experts on the ground in India. I think there's no more important time to be doing this kind of work, uh, collaborating between institutions, collaborating across countries. Um, it's just an essential time for students to learn the value of collaboration and intercultural engagement. So I'm very grateful and especially excited for this particular talk. We are um, paying attention to the news with our eyes peeled and our, our hearts um, uh, being held carefully and um, feeling like we're moving a little bit out into the breathing room here in the States and, and um, excited to hear progress that will be happening in um, different parts of India over the next month. So we're looking forward to this talk. Thanks so much. And Dr. Balu, we're really excited to hear uh, uh, from you as well. Just so excited to be here. Thank you. Lucinda? Yes, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I echo definitely everything that Donna and Carol shared and just really appreciate being able to have our students all connected and involved um, and learning more about the situations there in India. So thank you for sharing all yeah. with us today, Dr. Balu. Thank you all so much. And uh, like Carol said, it's such a, I think this very, very uh, session itself portrays so much that the world is desperately in need of not just the principles of collaboration, transcending boundaries of institutions, countries, and just coming together and trying to explore and wish that the whole world becomes better. So how does it matter to an American to uh, really want India to do well? Or how does it matter to India to understand that African countries shouldn't suffer as much as other countries? And I think COVID uh, is just an excuse. Uh, to me, the title is just an excuse to speak on what I love to speak about. And uh, I think COVID, presents us a great opportunity. It's a, it's a crisis from coming from a physician, a doctor, and who uh, sadly uh, carries the burden of having at least one or two people personally who has died each day the last one month. It's very, very painful. Watching young Indians as young as 22 to 25, I'm not saying older people should die. I'm just saying that it's a much more painful when you believe that this is going to be an illness of people about 50 years and you suddenly see very young people just about setting out the journeys of life and then three days they're just gone. When you hear the challenges of economy, when you hear the challenges that villages are now suffering from, when you look at the infrastructure breaking down and when you know that, and you feel so sad, but you also feel so energized when you see physicians work 40 hours nonstop, when you see nurses drenched in sweat but refusing to leave the intensive care unit, when you know that their children are waiting for the mothers back home and these young ladies are so passionately involved that you really, your heart goes out for all these people. You also see uh, what vaccines can do. And you know, I grew up in a generation of uh, physicians of medicine and I, when I went to medical school, we always believed Every vaccine would take at least 10 years to hit the market from the time you start thinking about it. And that's what we studied. The trials take time, designing these, testing it out, and then releasing it to the world out large. This is a slow, painful process. So it's taught us a lot. It's taught us how vulnerable we as mankind are. It's shown us our place in a sense. It has shown us that we can't take the earth for granted. It has shown us that we can't be disrespectful of nature and try to play around just for our own selfish reasons. Now, uh, increasingly, the world is now inclined to believe this is a genetically modified or an engineered virus. Whichever country initiated it, which lab began the process, which lab didn't care about safety, are all mute questions. The whole world is suffering. What matters is we, we seem to have brought this on ourselves. So it's shown. How, how petty can human thinking be? It's shown how vulnerable we are. It's shown how advanced science can be that you can engineer stuff like this and bring about genetic cleavages in a virus to manifest itself in different ways. It's shown about how advanced science can be on one side in this kind of thinking. It's like electricity. It can actually power an electric chair and kill people. It can also light up your lights. Same science has also shown up how vaccines can be made in 12 to 18 months flat. So I think we have learned a lot of lessons. The lessons of 
in every way you know, at the individual level it has shown how difficult each of us have you know uh, what we have gone through we have all gone through so much personally we are all used to lifestyles where we grew up in ecosystems where just there is no way anybody taught us how to be alone with ourselves it's when i am saying this right you know we are always chattering and our minds are always all over the place and we are always love to be with company with friends with a family and then suddenly you're alone and suddenly you're so much time with family that you're again pissed off so i find this very strange things you know we've all been complaining that we don't have enough time for family and this last one year we've been spending so much time with family and that's also a problem so we have all kinds of situations that virus has exposed us to so at the individual level at the family level it's brought out the best in us sometimes it also brought out the worst in us as a society again it's brought out the best in us i know in india last time when the country shut down thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, people were migrated in search of livelihood to different cities had to walk back hundreds of kilometers to reach their destinations and while it seemed painful that they did that it seems unacceptable that we can allow humanity to go through that what also stood out was the thousands of families which actually welcomed them on the way fed them made sure they were all taken care of and they actually reached their homes so this is something unimaginable i i know that uh, as 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 a, the head of an organization whose resources are getting depleted each day how painful it is and last year we had to let go of close to 25% of our people we let them off at svym and at gram we laid off close to 70% of our people it's extremely challenging when you know the people need the resources and you don't have to meet those you know you're not able to meet it how difficult it is to be the head of an organization you know I, and from that to this time we realized that we can't let this happen to our people anymore and we all found the resilience the contingency plans to make sure that nobody went through that this year within 7 8 months we found the strength within ourselves with, as institutions to bear and endure it seems to warm our heart that young students who knew what we are doing in cornell could go around raising funds and sending it to us who could sell their uh, the clothes made by our women in our villages and still make sure those women are continuing to do their work and live their lives so you really know that you can find solution so these are all the silver linings in these dark clouds so we should stop i think this is a great time and this session is so important to me especially because it gives me time to reflect to pause to ask ourselves what have we learned from this it's a year now what what has it taught us what has it taught us at the personal level at the community level at a global level and why are and how does it connect to the program that each one of you is engaged in whether you're a faculty whether you're a student why are you even in a university setting even university education has changed i'm sure uh, we have all seen this right the last fall semester uh, the courses i taught was on zoom to the students at cornell it was a new experience for me as much as it is for most of the faculty who have been teaching on zoom and other things we are all learning that brick and mortar institutions may not be as relevant as what we thought they were so we need to discover new models new hybridized versions of how do you balance both and how do you actually embed learning in ecosystems which are going to be completely new to all of us so i think there's a lot that we have learned and i'm going to just put this all thoughts together and possibly talk for 30 35 minutes because i'd love to listen to the students and to all of you and spend a lot more time engaging with each other so what it has taught me at the personal level and what it does i think it, it applies to every one of us it has taught me that humanity is alive now for a long time i have been hearing this oh my god it's such a cruel world out there it's so difficult it's so challenging inequities are horrendous but all that is true what it has taught me is humanity is alive and well and that there is still a heart beating out there for mankind it has taught me that whether we like it or not boundaries don't matter whether we like it or not wealth doesn't really supplement a lot of other things it at best can make your life easy but a rich man can also get covid and die we have seen that we seen the best of families the poorest of families everybody had the same challenges for once we had the level playing field in this world in a very strange way the playing field was leveled out so everybody had to endure suffering of different levels different scales it might be differential but suffering was real it showed that science can help science can actually make a difference as much as can screw up to me it showed that it is not just not just that we could you know uh, the virus was constantly evolving and mutating 
But I think our responses and our resilience is also evolving and mutating. We as people found the inner strength to also evolve and find new meaning and new answers. More importantly, what it showed me is, you know, uh, there's the concept of one world can no longer be dismissed away as a fashion statement or a slogan. It can no longer be said that, you know, these are just things which are figments of imagination of all this uh, thinkers who have nothing else to do and they just talk big. I believe that one world is not just for healthcare and medicine and science, it goes beyond it, it's also for finding solutions. I remember last year when, when uh, the US was going through something similar to what India is going through now, uh, India is not a rich country, but its richness was demonstrated in making sure we could ship off ventilators and whether science had discovered uh, chloroquine was going to be effective or not, thousands and thousands of uh, millions of tablets of chloroquine and whatever we could do was shipped out to the United States without worrying too much about what happens if it comes to India next. I think in, in all this sense, well, some nations demonstrated selfishness. Well, some nations, science demanded that you shut your boundaries. Some countries like Australia said, if you fly back from India, there'll be a $50,000 fine. Some nations also decide that, that you'll have bubble flights. Like today, you can still return back to the United States. The American government takes its people back. So we had all kinds of demonstrations of this uh, responses. It brought out great leadership, whether it's New Zealand, Singapore, South Korea, and great extent India in the first wave. It also brought out the worst in all of us. Public health was stretched beyond imagination. So I think we all learned so much. And more importantly, like I said, it showed that we have no choice but to have a collective response because our survival itself is at stake. Now, today, every nation is saying that it's not just about storing vaccines. It's not just about stockpiling enough for ourselves. But if we don't share it with countries where this crisis is real, it's not going to stop there. It's going to come back to haunt us again. So unless we solve the problem for 7.5 billion people, we haven't solved the problem. So the United States cannot say my science and technology is only for my citizens, as much as India cannot say that being the largest producer of vaccines in the world, we will not share it. You know, I remember now that I'm part of the highest office of the land, there's a lot of conversations that keeps going around all this. And for a long time, India was seen uh, within, the, within the domestic politics actually is very critical. They say that how could you give away 46% of the vaccines you manufacture to the rest of the world? And that's why we are all suffering. You didn't vaccinate enough of Indians. But I think that's a very wrong way of looking at it. It's a very parochial, uh, I would even say a paranoid way of looking at it. You know, you do good when it is needed the most. So there's a saying in India, we say that the right hand shouldn't even know the generosity of the left hand. And when you look at, you don't distinguish and say Indians first, rest of the world next. I think we have to recognize that we have to find collective responses. We have to be collectively resilient and we have to shape it in the answer that we can take care of this one world concept. So what it has taught me also that it has redefined the very notion of togetherness. Togetherness is no longer physical. It has demonstrated that togetherness can be a very deep uh, internal understanding and virtual spaces can make you as comfortable the togetherness as physical levels. So if intimacy doesn't have to be just physical anymore. The emotions of intimacy can transcend everything else and technology can be a great provider of that space to be intimate. We can, we can talk and share the joys. I remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, one of the students at Cornell, and I saw Liz also joining in this conversation and she was got the award of the presidential scholar. As much as her parents, my heart as a professor being with pride to just watch her doing it. And you know that you can transcend and enjoy the joy through a technology platform. So you can, you can really feel that oneness, which I think is important. And students of this generation have to grow up in the ecosystem where they understand all this. They have to recognize that we need to go beyond boundaries to solve the world's problems. COVID is just one of them. We can't really get stuck with the public health problem and not look at the larger issues. So we need to know that we have to take all ourselves together. We have to, we have to really function in a way that transcends all this. I also recognize one more thing. 
this gave an opportunity to push ourselves beyond traditional boundaries of the self itself, the individual, of our families. Now, our concerns went beyond just three or four of us in a small little nuclear family to the larger family, which we didn't think about. You know, growing up in Indian culture, where living in joint families two generations ago was a norm. Your grandparents were with you and you lived with your parents till long enough and your parents then came and lived with you and that, that's how we were. And that is the normativeness of it. And from there on to just being husband, wife and one child or something like that. And today we suddenly realize those circles are now re-emerging. Those, those boundaries are re-emerging. We are finding new friends amongst countries. So what do we need to do? And I want to sort of uh, share this and end it there. I want to say, how does this one world look like in a real sense, beyond just the abstractions, beyond just the conceptual understanding? Let me take health. Now we know that a virus in the United States is as much a problem to Mozambique or to India or Sri Lanka, as much as a virus in India is going to be a problem to anywhere else in the world. Technology is also meant proximal uh, connectivities, the boundaries of proximal connectivities have altered. The, the airlines and all that we can do to connect trade and things produced in one country reaches the other country in three days now and people can travel in 24 hours and go to the other side of the world in 24 hours. With this kind of enormous network existence, what we need to network is interdependence, not isolation not polarization. And unfortunately, countries are now tending towards being polarized. But we need to show that beyond just those narrow thinking of just me and myself, we need to now understand networking, interdependence begins with trust. So I think our students and the next generation should realize, how do you learn to trust each other at a very micro level, at an individual level, at a family level, and as countries? How do you stop? And, and understand that competing cannot, should not be at the cost of something else for the other. You can compete in healthy ways. And the real competition and success of competition is when you collaboratively compete. And that's a new definition. You know, I, I would have said 10 years ago, this session wouldn't have happened. You cannot imagine one good university and another good university sitting across a table and saying, how do we get all our students together? It's simply unimaginable. I, I, have been, I have been in this space for more than two decades interacting and engaging with several universities around the world. And if I were to talk to University A and say that, you know what, why don't University A and B work together? And the University B would say, no way. We want our own stamp on it. We want our brand value on it. But look at it today. Three, four different institutions coming together and only exploring how do our students learn together? How do they learn from each other? How do we learn from each other? This is something, this is a representation of the future to be. And this is the practical manifestation of the concept of one world in a very, very small, uh, in a very simple way. And I think when you look at health, we need to understand that CDC or NIH are no longer American institutions. I know several million people around the world get their authentic health information from these sites. Now you cannot, so you can no longer put out material to just satisfy Americans. You have no choice but to grow, evolve, and put out information which satisfies the world that is hungry for this information. So in a country like India, we have our own providers of information, so we don't have the need. But I'm sure several small countries cannot even afford to have the website that CDC has got. Forget the capabilities CDC has got. So I think it is going to be redefining it. I had once, many years ago, and Donna may remember this, I had mentioned at Cornell that Cornell and the ILR school can no longer talk about labor and industrial relations from an American perspective. I think Cornell has outgrown it. You have no choice. You're obligated to think of these things from a global perspective. That's a real responsibility. And I think these kind of institutions have to gear up, even when global institutions like WHO sometimes fall behind and don't do on what they're expected to do. I think other agencies must step in and bring in this notion in healthcare. So look at it from the social construct. Societally and socially, we are all living in a world which is enormously different. We are diverse, but we need to find reasons to come together rather than use the diversity to keep separating us. We either use the, the color, we use race, we use ideological thinking, we use economic status to keep separating us. But instead of that, I think COVID and this one world concept should remind us how do we use the very same frameworks 
and explore for ways to come together. And this is what I think future of education needs to be, because we need to create and embed that genetic material, that DNA of togetherness at different spaces. So I think today, whether it is health or society in general, economies, because that's what is the real binder, right? Now, we can, if, if America gets a cold and its economy catches a cold, the European economy collapses or to a great extent, Indian economy gets affected because we are all over the place. And we have no choice, you know, whether you and I as citizens and ordinary people who want to globalize or not, our corporations are globalizing. They're globalizing menacingly for profits. But can we globalize for reasons beyond profits? Can we redefine emerging economies, not from the context of just profit maximization for an individual or for institutions, but from the perspective of, uh, you know, benefit optimization? And I want to give an example. And I think that needs to change. I'll give a small example, and many people may not like this example, but a world global philanthropic institution, which is much and it's constantly talks about vaccinating the world and was behind the science of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, finally doesn't even look at giving this away as global patent for everybody. Suddenly narrows it down and says, no, 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 we have we own it, and we as the promoters of this are insisting you commercialize it. And today. One of the reasons why every single citizen of this world is unable to access the vaccine because he can't afford it is because of the cost. And if just that promoting agency had a global obligation and redefined itself to benefit optimization, if he or she or the institution had said, instead of maximizing profits for this company, if I look at optimizing benefit for society, what a, what a great narrative that would have become. And I think this generation of young people as they go out in this world to shape their lives, have to stop thinking of themselves and start expanding their thinking to build a new economy where the new economic narrative has to be benefit of every stakeholder that is involved in the economic food chain, which means the end of today can no longer look for jobs, but to look for lifetime passion, passions, which is defined as just creating private gains for themselves, but ensuring public good for the rest of the world. So if they can redefine their very purpose of existence, because it's not about making, not making money. They have to make their life and livelihoods. That's a private gain. But in the process of creating private gains for themselves, the new narrative for them can be, how do I create public good for the rest of this world? And in whichever space they operate in, healthcare, education, uh, environment, trade, commerce, any space that you are in, if this can be the guide, guiding beacon light for these people, what a great world we can all create. So I think whether it is environmental integration, whether it is academic integration, where we learn from each other, whether Cornell and the knowledge, Allegheny and uh, Iowa, the food sciences and agriculture that Iowa has contributed to the rest of the world can contribute to everybody else. I think we need to find reasons to share and not reasons to hold. So I think what COVID has taught us is unless we do all that, real resilience is never going to come. Unless we use this opportunity to pause, redefine our understanding of why we exist as an individual, what can we do as families, what can we do as societies, what can we do as nations, and unless we can embed all this into the consciousness of the end of today, I think the future is going to be bleak. But I am convinced all the solutions that we have discovered to fight the COVID crisis in different forms, I know some of them have been very selfish, and that's exactly a demonstration of what we should not be. There are important lessons. They demonstrate that we should not be that. The isolation, the polarization, the closing down of each other, uh, help from each other, etc. The opening up of generosity, of thinking beyond one's boundaries, and the large heartedness several nations have displayed. You know, I, 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 I just recently read an announcement the Indian foreign minister had been in the United States. And the United States has agreed to give away a lot of vaccines and raw material for India because they know that the India needs the help right now. And if it's not now, then when? So I would like to conclude with what the way Rabi Hillel, uh, the famous court office, if not now, then when? If not me, then who else? I think that should be the question every young person should ask. And to me, global exchange programs are truly exchange. We all get from each other this spark of humanity. We share from each other, we share with each other, not just cultural competences. We share this basic seed of loving 
and sharing and caring for each other that transcends relationships of just the personal and goes into national and supranationals. So to me, global citizenship should become a very well-defined embedded part of the structures on which global service learning programs are going to be built. We have to now set new metrics, new definitions, new learning outcomes of how we are going to do this in different spaces. And we at the uh, Vivek and the youth movement through our institution of BIIS would like to work and collaborate with all of you. It, it has to be co-created. We don't have solutions. All of us, none of us have solutions for this. We just have programs. We now have to co-create a new normal where well, these are the things that we leave behind to the next generation. Whether it's thought at uh, Iowa or Cornell or Allegheny or thought at Mysore, I think that is irrelevant. And the very fact that we can use technology to sort of come together like this, that we can all come together to cross-pollinate each other's ideas, aspirations, and expertise. And together, we can truly build a better world. So I'm going to stop here. And I know I've already kind of overshot my time, but I'd love to listen and exchange ideas and thoughts with all of you. If, if I had to quickly conclude in three or four sentences what we have really done and learned and what I have personally learned, I think it has changed how we look at each other. We just changed how we look at ourselves and how we look at each other. The last one, we are no longer just partners in a program. I think there are essential necessities to ensure both of us move together. It has changed how we practice collaboration. It has redefined the very understanding of collaboration. It has redefined uh, how I connect to myself now. The last 14, 15 months, this, this space for contemplation has taught me how I can redefine. More, most importantly, it has redefined what the metrics of success is going to be. When can I say I'm successful in this life? When can a family say it's been successful? When can an institution say it's been successful? When can a country sit back and say, we have done it? I think that level of understanding of success where I already spoke about the togetherness, the collaboration, the interdependence, being there for each other, and all this actually truly manifesting as a networked economy, which looks at benefit optimization. If all those things were the ir of success. I think COVID and similar crisis in the future, are there's going to be small road humps or bumps on our journeys, and we will negotiate them. Otherwise, they could possibly be the beginning or the end of mankind itself. And that is the urgency we need to have in looking and designing these kind of programs. So thank you so much again. I would like to thank Rekha, Sudarshan, and the entire SUIM team for facilitating this on a day and time that also worked for me. I was explaining to Rekha, and I already disappointed her once, that once uh, last week when I just, last month or two months ago when the date was fixed and I couldn't make it. Today also seemed to be terrifying. Because suddenly this morning, we were asked to prepare ourselves for a very important meeting. And the meeting was supposed to end at 6, and it didn't seem to end at 6.22. And my assistant had reminded me, you can't just let Rekha down. And what I told myself was, forget letting Rekha down. I can't let myself down, for I wouldn't forgive myself that if I could not share these ideas with these young people, I would feel that I'm letting the future generation down. So I would like to say that it's been a great pleasure being here and I enjoyed every minute of it. And is there anything that you'd like to ask, challenge me or get me to explain a little bit more, I'd be more than happy. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. In fact, uh, the spontaneous overflow of your thoughts has opened up, give us, given all of us enough food for thought. And uh, I now take this opportunity to open up for questions. Uh, uh, I request all the participants to unmute themselves uh, one by one we go with the questions or put up the questions on the chat box too so that we would take uh, take that up and uh, we would interact thank you it would help if we could just give a 10 second uh, of who you are because we don't see your picture and which university you come from and what are you studying and the major that you're doing that would really be helpful thank you yeah Yeah, it's your time, uh, dear friends. Uh, you could go one by one. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Um, oh. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. So, so, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so hi, Dr. Ball. My name is Chihil Yunus. I'm currently hi. studying at the Cornell University's Industrial Labor Relations School. I'm a rising junior. Mm -hmm. uh, and my question to you, basically to start off, thank you for so much for taking time out of your day to talk to us about this. 
uh, considering your expertise and your uh, experience. It's very influential and very informative. Uh, so just going off of your uh, discussion about COVID and how it's changed a lot of, you know, different aspects of society, specifically healthcare. Um, one thing I'm pretty interested in studies is through healthcare and fintech uh, and healthcare tech. So um, one thing I noticed in America and, you know, Europe, there's a lot of healthcare companies moving towards value-based care, um, you know, focus more on the quality of care rather than the profits that you make. And overall, that'll decrease your costs and increase your profits. I noticed that in India, there's a similar um, approach for even pre-COVID. So I was just wondering how that's changed post-COVID or just, you know, in dealing with COVID right now and how the, you know, healthcare models have changed in total. Well, uh, what I'm seeing on the ground, so it's a great question, uh, is three or four things that have uh, significantly changed. Okay, a lot of things are still work in progress. I wouldn't say that they've reached end points. The first thing is, traditionally, everybody thought a public health problem is a responsibility of just the state or the government, what we call it, right? So we thought the government's public health systems would respond to it, which they did. In the first wave, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, for, for two, three decades, people like me in the public administration, public policy space, have been struggling to bring about what we call convergence of government action, right? One ministry not telling the other ministry what it is doing and not working together. And therefore, their work was never really getting complementary or, or, or adding to each other or creating more value than what it could do, right? Truly one and one would have been 11 if they worked together. But COVID necessarily brought it together, brought various public agencies together to work for a common cause. And they recognize that these things work. Convergence is not just something which has to be spoken about, but you can actually make sure it delivers. And I think the second wave, though people say that we are not able to manage systems are collapsing, I'm not, I'm not too sure that is true. The mortality rates, fatality, case fatality rates are still one of the lowest in the world in India. We are still able to do a good job of vaccinating people, though we might not have done what we could, could do. That's always a gap. But then what people are not recognizing is if the first wave had not happened and prepared the public health systems with what it has already prepared, either the situation would have been much worse. I don't know if you're getting my point, right? The certain set of preparedness happened. That is because of this convergence happening. Now, the system has been stretched because nobody, I don't think we did a work good enough in doing the genomic sequencing to predict the kind of mutations that are arising. Even as a physician, in the first wave, a simple example, in the clinical space, we were told to look at pulmonary signs, right? We would do a CT scan, we would do CT scores of patients, we'd look at it the inflammatory markers, and I'm just talking medical terms, but that's what uh, that we discovered is important for us to diagnose and treat. And in the second wave, the mutation was completely different and it, it just went for a toss. We recognized that those are not things that are important anymore. There's certain other things that are increasingly becoming important. People are getting discharged from the hospital because their lungs improved, but they suddenly developed rapid myocarditis in two days of time, which were never happening in the first place. We discovered that the black fungus is a bigger problem today than what it was in the first phase. So we're discovering new clinical mechanisms to respond. And so doctors are expanding their thinking to say that I cannot think in isolated ways. I need to think in larger ways. Never before, we do have teams in, around the world, like in the US, medical teams working together. But you can never imagine pulmonologists, neurologists, virologists, epidemiologists, healthcare policy makers, healthcare administrators, all coming together and working. This is demonstrated. We could never imagine public sector, private sector, and civil society organizations like mine coming together and working. So it is. It has taught us that collaboration and convergence is a necessity, which earlier we were talking about, but we actually did it. And today we're able to better manage it because of that. That's on one 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 level of thinking, right? So I think even science that we suddenly recognize that there's certain things which has to be provided for by the state. Like we, there's a large number of people in India who cannot afford the vaccine on their own. And you need to ensure that it's available to them as much as a lot of people who are saying that I have the money, I don't need it free, I'm ready to pay for it. So we are suddenly discovering new financing mechanisms for this, for responding to it. There is a differential pricing model where the rich can actually go pay. There's always an argument which say that are the rich getting preference? No. Everything is being controlled and modulated and modified through digital-based apps, where the state exactly knows how many people are getting it free, and only small percentage are being opened up to the market. So market forces is not running riot, right? Which is a completely new thing. Earlier it had been they had to run riot and take over the entire system. So there is a clear understanding of the role for the state in the public administration space. We always explore what is the role of the state, 
what is the role of private market forces right and and is there a state failure is there a market failure and this time we recognize that there's a minimalistic approach to allowing things to fail, or there's a maximalistic approach to allowing things to fail and a minimalistic approach to ensuring that success uh, I, I'm, or they were not working it properly there's a great amount of awareness in looking at things don't fail and markets don't fail as much as states don't fail so i think these are all great changes in the healthcare sector now coming back to the specific thing about what you asked people are also recognizing that quality matters price considerations matter a balance of all these matters and the usefulness of training and building manpower for the sector matters the necessity for creating infrastructure matters but earlier we never had an opportunity to look at rural infrastructure from the way from the same lens as we looked at urban infrastructures today we recognize that if rural areas are not embedded with capacities urban health systems are going to be congested and it will fail so it's it's in the interest of the urban residents themselves to ensure that rural healthcare becomes better so now we are recognizing the by, by a very very structural mechanism the interdependence and the inter problems of geographically challenged areas if they are not taken care of well i'm going to suffer in the city so i better take care of them in the villages so i think it has it has exposed healthcare systems in good ways as well as bad and we are learning from the negatives and i think um, i am pretty confident Uh, that the third wave which we are all expecting would possibly be far better managed or it would not even be visible as a wave because we now have so much that we have learned obviously the virus could cheat us all and behave in its own way but i think today we have learned that we need to do genomic uh, sequencing every day which we never did in the past so we are now recognizing that variants are not just coming from britain or uk or brazil it's coming from a back door from the next state right we just 3 days ago we you know beitan has a new variant which can be very deadly so we are, our, our science and our uh, planners are already preparing for it we know that the least immunized age group is children so how do you embed capacity for pediatric care around the country including rural areas so i think we are reaching a point where we are getting better prepared as a system and the separation between private and public is now dimming uh, and, and the reasons to make profits are still there people are making a lot of profits i wouldn't deny that but i think it's becoming more compassionate i don't even answer the question so all right thank you so much dr about that today question thank you sir uh, we have a question put up on the chat box yeah. with an inter- introduction of course uh, good morning doctor thank you for speaking to us my name is elis and i am an international student from brazil with a double major in international studies and global health studies uh my question is how is it possible if so uh that the corona virus uh, increase racial disparities and inequalities around the world uh the virus would it increase it ls the consequence of the virus and the and and the collo- collaborative action that is missing is going to increase it so let's look at africa as a nation right uh the research is still not shown us whether there's any particular genetic makeup of an individual which could possibly be a natural protectant against coronavirus there's a lot of theories going around and i'm not too sure any of them are conclusively proved it i'll give an example anthropologically distinct indigenous tribal communities in the areas where we operate surely have a very far lesser case load than their counterparts in rural areas now is it because of some genetic makeup or is it because of the cultural tendency to self isolate in certain stressful situations i think research has to expose it we need anthropological studies as much as we need medical studies to demonstrate the causality of all this so i believe as a nation if we now look at african countries who do not have the intellectual bandwidth to make their own vaccines who do not have the system capacity to handle healthcare needs of populations exposed to corona virus if the rest of the world doesn't support them then inequities are going to come in so inequities are going to be a consequence of not the virus but about human reactions to the virus and the disease that comes up if the rest of the world in in, in uh, i'm not like i'm not wanting to parrot what i said earlier but if the rest of the world can wake up and see this not as a consequence of a small little country in ghana or in kenya or nigeria but as a problem which is a problem of the world and we have to respond and demonstrate it and give something to them 
if I can worry less about storing vaccines for a potential future crisis in my country and distributing it away to another country which needs it today, because it's going to demolish, dem destroy the country completely, then I can prevent the inequities. So I think it less to do with the virus and more to do with how we as human beings in different locations are responding to it. If we decide to enhance inequities and, and either by race or class or by country levels, it's going to happen. But this is an opportunity. We allowed this to happen in HIV AIDS. We allowed the pharmaceutical industry to enhance the inequities around the world. I think it's time now. By being thankful to the pharmaceutical industry that it put its money into the research that was necessary for the vaccine, also understands that we need to draw a line between uh, greed and need, like Mahatma Gandhi said. And once we can define that, that will be the first step towards reducing the inequities that you're talking about. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Paul. Oh, yeah. please hi. go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Brian Park. Um, I'm also studying in the School of Industrial Labor Relations at Cornell. Mm -hmm. And the question I had was, um, uh, if the global cooperation we see today, such as like um, America giving India vaccines, is a result of um, a response to like the crisis that's COVID. How can we ensure like such cooperation without the need for such crises? It's a, it's a great question. I think the crisis should not should just be an excuse to kickstart a response, but reflection about how the response actually benefits each other is what can sustain it. So that's what I was trying to explain. Um, if there's a war, we we sort of people go back to the war zone to sort of help people. If there's an earthquake, let's say Haiti has an earthquake. So every time we look for a disaster and a respond to respond to that disaster, I think we now have to have, especially your generations, Brian, and kids like you and that entire generation of undergrads or grad students today in universities, must recognize that these are the these are the touch points we taught this world that we should not no longer be reactive. It's time for us to be responsive. The responsiveness is now building that, 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 that structure, which can truly be uh, preempt pre those disasters even, or prevent them, or if they happen anywhere in the world, treat them as a global disaster and respond adequately. Now, we have spent too much time looking at ourselves and too little, and then even in those responses and reactions, if you're always thinking about what are I to gain, if I'm giving something now to India because Last year, India gave it to us. That's an inappropriate response. If we're giving something to India now because India needs it more than me, that's appropriate response. And I think we need to build a gen. And I, the only way this can be done, I believe, is embedding this DNA into the next generation. Where each one of you don't, you, you preserve your individual existence. You preserve your individual identities. You get your affirmation from your citizenship. But understand that your passport is just for convenience. But your consciousness has to be global. So your concerns then will be global. Your compassion will be for global requirements. I think that is the that is the space we need to reach out to. Otherwise, we'll just be very reactionary to everything that happens around us. I think we need to be much more than that and build a cohort of young people who share this vision. It's going to be slow, painful work. But you know, a thousand mile journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. And I believe DSL programs and programs like that are a very essential first step. In fact, uh, the 10, 11 years of experience uh, that we have at Cornell shows that it's much more than a step. It, 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 brings, in, it brings in a lot of magical benefits. Hi, Dr. Balu. My name is Ariel and I'm a sophomore in ILR. Hi, um, I want to thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. Um, so a lot of this talk kind of reminded me of the increasing issue of climate change. And I think it really relates on, I, I wonder what you think of this, how an increased uh, conscious on global climate change will impact the willingness of people to see across national lines, especially because we're all beholden to one another in terms of our climate. The easy answer, Ariel, for me would be to tell you to take my development class when I come to Cornell. Uh, I, I talk of, you know, true sustainability uh, needs to go beyond the way we define it, right? We define sustainability uh, in the traditional United Nations language as your, my generation, 
just consuming enough resources to ensure that we leave behind enough resources for your generation to consume. I think that's a very narrow way of understanding human development and society itself. If that were to be true, it's very resource driven. It is not driven by enlightened consciousness coming from you or me, right? I have to teach myself to consume less, driven by, by titrating my needs and not by determining how much resources are out there for me to use. I can have, I can have a million dollars in my bank, but if I only need $20 a day, that's all I need, right? So I only need to make sure that that's what I need for daily life. So it's about not about what I have, but it's about what I need. And there's a very different paradigm of understanding this. So I believe uh, looking at what, constantly looking at building what I have has led us to three crises. The first crisis that we have built for ourselves is an enormously disproportionate crisis, what the ecological crisis, what you're talking about. There's several reasons for this, our consumption patterns, the way we destroyed uh, ecology, forest, environment, climate, uh, climate justice issues. I bucket all of them under that and the consequences of what we created for ourselves. I, I look at it, the next crisis that we have also done is what I would say a societal crisis, a crisis of enormous inequities, social and economic inequities, right? And we seem to, now today, if I were to give an example of the United States, which all of you can relate to, Virtually 1% of Americans control 99% of your resources. And in India, 1% of Indians control 73% of India's wealth and resources. That's simply unacceptable. But why has it become that way? Because I kept on building what I feel that I need to have. But it's not about what I really want. And so I think the third, and all this is because of a third level of crisis. And that's why you have to solve that problem. So climate justice cannot be solved as a technical issue. It needs a deeper adaptive solution. And to me, the third crisis, the crisis of the self, now, every person today has forgotten what is the purpose of our existence. Why do I live? What is my contribution in this world now that I'm born here? I really don't know there's life before me, there's going to be life after me, whatever my culture or religion says. But I do know I have a life right now and a life around me. And if I can understand and appreciate why I exist, what is my true purpose, then I will know how to manage the ecological ecosystem around me. I know how to manage a socio-economic ecosystem around me. And if that enlightened individual is built, I think climate issues can be sorted. Now, what is happening is climate activists are just talking about it around the world here and there. That is not enough. That is not going to change human behavior in you and me. But what we need is a climate activist embedded in each one of us, which means the self has to evolve and change. So I think COVID presents us with those kind of opportunities. When you start self-reflecting and look at your life the last 14, 15 months and how it has changed and what does the change mean in real terms and what are you going to do about the change for the future, then you will possibly enlighten, kick, uh, sort of lighten, light the spark up within you to say that I have a role to play in this. Otherwise, the easy option for most of us is I'm too small and insignificant in this battle for climate justice. You know what? I can't do anything much. Let me give an example which will touch all your all your lives. How long ago did you change your cell phone? When did you buy a new phone? Or when did you buy a new laptop? Or when did you buy a new dress? Or if I were to ask you a very uncomfortable personal question, Ariel, how many sets of clothing you buy every year for yourself? Before you answer, I don't. Okay, you want to answer? Go ahead, Ariel. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say more than I would like to admit. A number, a, a, any number, just guess a number and throw it out there. Eight sets, nine sets, 10 sets? Probably like 12 sets. 12 sets, right? An average person around the world buys and owns nine set, sets of pairs of dresses every year. And do you know that we only need three to live a comfortable life every year? You know, if I were to reframe the question and say, how many, how many sets of genes you have? Right? One, two, three, four, five. And every pair of jeans that, was, that you have bought has consumed 8,000 liters of water to make. So if you're talking of climate justice and protesting wearing a pair of jeans out there, you should remember you've already consumed 8,000 liters of water. So when you buy the next pair of jeans, if your enlightened self-consciousness says, well, I have a role, I have, I have, I have, I have something to contribute to fighting climate change, and that this is a decision which I am going to take. I'm not going to buy the second pair of clothing. It looks like a small decision, but it's a big decision. 
if every single young person around the world, those three, three and a half, four billion people make this choice, climate change is not going to be something which we can't manage. So I think it's not about the larger. We all we we macroize the crisis so much that we feel helpless. But if you break it down to small steps that you and I can do every day, how many of us change? You know, I remember as a kid, you guys may not even know this. We used to get what is called refills for our pens. You know, you have a pen. And when you the pen refills ink gets over, you just take the ref the the inside refill and throw it out and buy a refill and put it in. I don't remember using a refill now for the last decade or more. You know, you you have a pen, you use it, you throw it, you buy another pen, you use it, you throw it. So I think if you can change the simple lifestyle, it looks very small. What I'm saying is very small, but all the small steps can become very significant steps. And to me, that is the person we need to create. And if, the, if you can work on the self and the crisis of the self in this sense and sort it out, ecological crisis and the socio-economic crisis get sorted out automatically. I don't know if it makes sense, but that's what I believe in. Thank you, sir. Uh, friends, we have uh, enough time, I think, for about one or two questions. Uh, uh, yeah, if anyone want to go next. We have another five minutes before we conclude. We could take another one or two questions. I'm hoping to bump into you guys if you all have a physical class next year and if things continue as it is. I usually come there in the fall each year. And at the ILR school, I teach two courses which have become reasonably popular nowadays. One is a course of an alternate approach to sustainable development, where I practicalize everything I spoke now and teach it in doable steps. Uh, and I teach a course on leadership. How do you lead a, to create a new world order? And, I don't call that the course name, but the course name is uh, how do you prepare yourself to lead the social change that I'm talking about. So hopefully I'll bump into you guys when I come there and I'm really looking forward to travel being travel ban being lifted and you can do it beyond the online mode in which I taught last year. Well, I think, uh, yeah, with uh... No more questions. I think uh, it is time that we call it a day and uh, conclude the session. Uh, it has been a wonderful uh, session, uh, Dr. Balu. Uh, the take-home messages, uh, I think, uh, with COVID being a crisis, but an opportunity, and the changing ecosystems, the resilience to cope, uh, the, the communities and the frontline workers coming together, the collective response, interdependence, and everything. The need versus greed, the crisis of the self, and uh, last but not the least, humanity is alive. That's uh, uh, really a great message. So thank you very much from all of us here for your time and uh, for this uh, wonderful session, sir. Uh, so on behalf of all the university students and the interns, I thank you for this. I think there is one hand up. I think that, Ethan is just clapping. So thank you, Ethan. Yeah, Brian, I think, has put up the hand. Yeah, you could go with that question. Oh, no, I was just clapping. Thanks. OK, OK, then. OK. So uh, I, uh, with that note, I think uh, we will conclude uh, the session. We thank all of you uh, for having uh, you know, graced this uh, wonderful session today. And looking forward to connect with you, uh, as usual, for the other sessions. and. Uh, of course, with your internships around, uh, uh, all enthusiasm around, we'll do the best that we'll be able to give you a virtual nice experience of having this uh, internship. So thank you for one and all, and uh, namaste. Have a nice day. Thank you. Cornell Group, please stay by. Sorry I, I, that I'm announced, but the Cornell Group, we're going to be put into a, into a, 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 a room. room. Yes, a breakout room. <laughs> Zoom room. Zoom room, yes. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Donna. See you, Carolyn. We'll see you. Bye-bye. We'll check, out. We'll check in. Soon.